Uh, would you please stand with us? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Take everything that's bothering you and let that go. And remember that Jesus deserves to be worshipped. Sorry about that. I'm actually looking at the wrong page. I'm so sorry. You give life. You give hope. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise, these hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise. These hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you. It's your breath 
In our lungs, and we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. And we pour out our praise for you. Oh. Well, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. But I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. And you tell me that you're pleased and that I never alone you go good far it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we Say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect Undeniable, I can hardly speak peace, so unexplainable, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love, love. You're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, 
It's who you are. I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we can come here and worship together. I pray that you would help to draw us closer to one another and closer to you. I pray that your will would be done. I pray that you give me the words to speak and that I would speak your words and not mine. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. morning. I'm going to borrow a medical term for what you just saw me do on the uh, front pew there where I was triaging what I actually needed to bring up here. I've gotten in the habit of carrying several notebooks and a monthly planner and all these things that I need to write down in place of a fully functioning memory like everyone else seems to be working with. It's a blessing, but every once in a while I find myself, do I need the black one or the blue one? I need the black one, in case I ever ask you. The black one is church, the blue one is school. <laughs> so last week we discussed Abraham, um, or I discussed Abraham. Abraham is uh, just such a complex human being. His relationship to God is um, at times baffling to me because he's so close to God, yet so completely human. Um, which actually is wonderful because that gives us so much hope. I also am uh, absolutely taken by scripture every time I read it because scripture does something that mythology never does. And that's, you read all the mistakes of the human beings in scripture, all of them. And then we even find ourselves baffled when it includes people like Lot on lists of righteous men. Because we'll talk about Lot in a moment, and I, I have a hard time with Lot being a righteous man. But all I'm seeing from Lot really are three instances in an entire life. The man could have been an incredibly righteous man, but I'm seeing three snapshots that are pretty big, baffling moments to how he got to be called a righteous man. So I have to extend some grace to Lot because the Bible calls him a righteous man, and I believe the Bible, so... I'm going to have to reconcile my opinions. That's how that works. If me and scripture don't agree on something, well, then I have to change, which is a blessing, really, 
It just doesn't always feel like one. All right. So we left off with chapter 17 talking about the covenant of circumcision. And if for some reason you missed last week, I uh, compared that to our new covenant of baptism. And I would like to again invite you, if you have never been baptized, I would love to baptize you. It's something in scripture that God actually tells us to do over and over again. If you have never been baptized, first I want to make sure you understand what you're doing. But after that, I would love the opportunity to baptize you. I would also like to do a membership class coming up. If you have any interest in becoming a member of Valley View Mennonite Church, I would like to do a baptism and membership class. However, if for whatever personal reasons you have, you're like, I don't really want to become a member of any church or whatever reasons you have, I would still highly encourage you to be baptized and I would still like to baptize you because that's bigger than being Mennonite. It's actually part of being a Christian. And that was my soapbox moment for this morning, I hope. Um, but that's a pretty nice soapbox to be standing on. Anyhow. Uh, I am on Genesis 18, three visitors. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great tree of Mamre while he was sitting in the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abram looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under the tree. Let me get something to eat, and you can re be refreshed and go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant, very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abram hurried to the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get, th get three seahs. <coughs> excuse me, a fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to his servant who hurried and prepared it. And he brought some curds and milk and a calf that had been prepared and he set it before them and they ate and he stood near them under a tree. Where's your wife Sarah, they asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you this, about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself, and she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, and she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Okay, so I'm just going to stop there for a second, and I'm going to pick up with the rest of this chapter in a moment. But I love this because Sarah's reaction to being told that she's going, well, she isn't told, she eavesdrops and hears that she is going to have a son, is the same reaction that Abraham had when God told him that he was going to have a son with his wife. They laughed. And they named their son Isaac, which means laughter. And I think that that's wonderful. I'm also of the opinion that people tend to live up to their names. And if you haven't met Isaac yet, which is impossible, you all have known him your whole lives. Um, but Isaac is a good time. But his name actually means laughter. Okay. And there's a very important verse in here because everything in logic and science, and I teach science, I love science, science is wonderful. Science is simply knowing. You look at the patterns God put in place and you know things. It's wonderful. It makes us feel very important. It's actually using the logic God gave us. It, science is a beautiful thing. But by all science and logic, an old woman doesn't have a baby. This isn't outlandish that they doubt what they're hearing. If I turn to anyone who's older and said, you're going to have a baby, they say, no, no, that's not happening. And they're probably right. But the important thing is uh, the messenger that God had sent says, is anything too difficult for God? Why are you laughing? One of the most fundamental things about Christianity is that miracles happen. 
we stop looking for them, we stop believing that they're happening, but miracles happen. This is really fundamental to having faith in general. You believe in miracles whether you want to admit it or not. You do believe in miracles. Miracles are good. I would encourage you to see the miracles that are happening all around you. <laughs> when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abram walked along with them to see them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord, by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has, been, has reached me. If not, I will know. So at this point, Abraham, Abraham bargains with God because he's like, you're a just God. You wouldn't destroy a city if there were 50 righteous men in the city. You wouldn't destroy the city. And God says, no, I wouldn't destroy the city for 50 righteous men. And so Abraham says, well, what about 45 righteous men? He's like, no, I wouldn't destroy the city for 45 righteous men. Well, what about 20? And God says, no, I wouldn't destroy the city over 20 righteous men. He says, well, what about 10? He said, no, I wouldn't destroy the city over 10 righteous men. Do you notice that God destroys these cities? Even though he says he wouldn't destroy it over 10 righteous men, there are not 10 righteous men in the entire city. As bad as our world looks sometimes, I guarantee you, you can walk downtown Erie, Pennsylvania, and find ten righteous men. You can't do that in Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, one of the only people that was deemed righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, I have issues with. <laughs> and I would say rightly so, because the snapshots I get of Lot are not flattering at all. As a father... I find him rather repulsive. So God sends two men, two angels, to Sodom. And they're going to spend the night in the square. And when Lot sees them, he says, no, don't do that. And I, I think we get a pretty clear idea of why he tells them, no, don't do that. So he brings them to his house. And every man of the city comes out and makes abominable requests about these gentlemen. And Lot refuses to send them out so that they can be harmed. And this is the part I judge Lot for. He says, no, take my daughters. I don't... I judge Lot for saying this, but what Lot is doing here is he's putting himself and his family in danger for the sake of protecting a visitor. And in this snapshot of Lot, all I can see is, man, this guy's a bad father. But what I don't see is that he knows there's something special about these men, and he is willing to endanger his own household in order to protect them. And there is something honorable about that, even though I hate what he just did. But anyhow, um, so the men are so mad at Lot for judging them as being wicked, don't do this wicked thing, that they say, we're going to deal worse with you than we were with these two fellas. And one of the messengers reaches outside, and all the people in the city are struck blind, and they get tired of trying to break in and go home, I think. That's, that's basically how that works out. And they tell Lot, we are going to destroy the city. If you have anyone in the city, get them out of the city. And he goes to his son-in-laws, and they laugh at him. God is going to destroy the city. <laughs> okay. And they don't go. So it's really just Lot and his wife and his two daughters who are escaping from Sodom. And they're given strict instructions. Don't look back. And here's the problem. 
of the short list of righteous people, one of them has no self-control <laughs> and looks back because they're human, and that's what humans do. Don't think about purple monkeys. What are you thinking about? Probably purple monkeys. Don't look back. Where? And she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abram got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward the land of the plain, and he saw a dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. <laughs> so when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abram, Abraham and brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. The next snapshot we get of Lot is not better <laughs> at all. Um, so Lot and his daughters, because his wife is now a pillar of salt, go and dwell in a cave. And the daughters realize, well, our husbands, the men that were so supposed to be their husbands, have been consumed by fire. They have no prospect for marriage. And because, as we discussed in Sunday school, children are deemed as a great treasure. They decide they're going to have children. The only man around is their father. Right. So they get their father inebriated and they conceive children. This is not a charming story, and I'm not spending a lot of time on it because there's nothing real wonderful I can say by bringing out the details, except something that Don had pointed out to me because I'm always uh, busy shooting my mouth off. He said, well, Lot's offspring here with his daughters, well, the oldest daughter is the mother of Moab, whose descendants are the Moabites, who are in the direct lineage of Jesus Christ. And it's very hard to get to the direct lineage of Jesus Christ without this event. So God doesn't have a plan B. He uses the horrible things happening. But this is uh, where Moab came from. I am... Uh, Moving on to chapter 20, I'm really amazed with the Eastern mind because I'm Western, I'm a Hellenistic thinker, as are you. The Eastern mind has a tendency to tell stories thematically as opposed to chronologically. Chronologically, we go in time order all the time. In fact, when I teach my kids how to write a good paper, we talk about chronology. You use time order words and you make sure that this is in order. A lot of times with Eastern writing, you have things that are thematic, where they're telling you about things that go together by a theme. I'm not sure what's happening in chapter 20, whether it's thematic or chronological, but it does start with a time order word, now. <laughs> Abraham moved from there into the region of Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur, where for a while he stayed at Gerer. And there Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister, so he's doing this again. <laughs> He did this last week with Pharaoh, but he's doing it again. This is my sister. He says that to Abimelech, who is uh, the king of Gurir. And he sent for Sarah and took her because she's very beautiful. Now, the reason why I brought up all that Eastern, Western chronology versus thematic is at this point, Sarah is not a young woman, if we're going chronologically. And that's not to say that she isn't beautiful, but she is no longer a young woman if we're going chronologically. Now, thematically, we could be telling a story about what happened years ago, and I don't know which it is, and I'm not trying to confuse you. But even though, if I go chronologically, even though she's not a young woman, she is still apparently beautiful enough that when Abimelech sees her, he's like, that one. I like that one. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, You are as good as dead because the woman you have taken is, is a married woman. Now Abimelech had gone near her, so he said, Lord, or had not gone near her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, She is my sister? And didn't she also say, He is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. And God said to him in a dream, Yes. 
I know you did this with a clear conscience, and so I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why I did not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that all yours will die. So God protects Abraham and Sarah from themselves again. But I find it strange that Abraham falls into the same pattern of when he's afraid because his wife's pretty and that people are going to kill him and steal his wife. He always goes back to the same thing. She's my sister. Just say you're my sister, which is partially true because she's his half-sister. This is before the Ten Commandments, so try not to be too judgmental. Um, The Ten Commandments in the book of Leviticus lay out some guidelines that they weren't working with quite yet. So some of this strikes you as being pretty off, I'm sure. But um, she is his half-sister, so this is partially true. Or at least, well, it is half true. So Abraham does pray for Abimelech, and he is blessed. And Isaac is born to Abraham when he's 100 years old. That's where we pick up with uh, chapter 21. At 100 years old, Isaac is born. I'm kind of curious. I know some people in this congregation have had children a little later than what is typical, but none of you were near 100. None of you were probably half 100 when you had your, what do they call those? Not Twilight Baby. Is that what they call those? Anyway. I can't imagine. I wake up in pain at 38 years old. Like my hand gets all arthritic and if I sleep on my shoulder wrong, my arm is numb. I can't imagine trying to chase a toddler at this age. Abraham is significantly older than I can expect to live. And he's about to chase toddlers again. But his other son, Ishmael, is 13 at this point. And in uh, chapter 21, shortly after uh, Isaac is born, um, they decide, Abraham and Sarah, actually Sarah, (laughs) gets very angry at Hagar the Egyptian, who is the mother of Ishmael. Uh, I was taken by something when I read through this story for the, I don't know how many times I've read through this story this week, but it was several. Um, What I was taken by is uh, Hagar. I actually have, Hagar is a pitiable person in this story. I never really looked at it like that before. Uh, probably in part because of the cartoon strips Hagar the Horrible that I used to read so much. So every time I hear the name Hagar, I'm like, Hagar the Horrible. So I probably have some unintentional thing going on when I hear the name Hagar. Hagar really is a pitiable person because she was given to Isaac, or was given to Abraham to have a child with. She has the child, and her masters are displeased with her or at least Sarah, whose idea this was initially, is really displeased with her. She is angry with her. But what she has to cling to is that she has a son with her master, so she's always going to be taken care of, and that her son will someday have some inheritance as a lesser member of the household. Because the the son of promise, which is typically the firstborn, gets the bulk of the inheritance, like two-thirds the inheritance, but that other son usually gets an inheritance And as her mother, she is going to be taken care of, right? It doesn't matter how bad things are, how much this wasn't my plan. She's okay. She's going to be okay. And her son's going to be okay. And then verse 21 happens. The child was grew and was weaned. I'm at verse 8 here if you're reading along. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of the slave woman and her son. 
For that slave woman's son will never share into the, in the inheritance with my son Isaac. This is actually very, uh, um, a kind of disturbing, at least for Hagar. This would be a very disturbing thing to happen, knowing that you're taken care of, but then your son is mocking the son of promise. So your mistress is like, get rid of her. All of that security you thought you had suddenly goes away. The matter distressed Abram greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be distressed about the boy and your manservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the manservant into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abram took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulder and sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes, and she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. When God opened her eyes, she saw a well of water, and so she filled the skin with water and gave it to the boy to drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. And while he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother gave a wife for him from Egypt. And at the end of uh, chapter 21, Abimelech makes a covenant with Abraham, or an agreement with Abraham, that he won't deal falsely with him. And Abraham plants a tree, which seems like a very odd thing to do as an old man, but as part of this covenant, he decides to plant a tree. Which is actually kind of a beautiful thing, because what he's doing is he's recognizing that he has descendants, and that these descendants might, in the desert, enjoy a tree. It's a place to sit under. It's a shade tree. It's a tamarisk tree. I suppose I could read that section. Then Abraham complained to him, complained to Abimelech about the well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this. You did not tell me, and I have heard about it only today. So Abraham brought a sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a treaty. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock, and Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart by themselves? And he replied, except these seven ewe lambs for my hand is a witness that I dug this well. So this place is called Beersheba, Beersheba because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Fickle, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. So there is so much that I know I'm racing through here. And again, I would highly encourage you to read through this again at a slower pace. So today, what I'm actually covering is chapters 18 through 22. And that's what it says in the bulletin, although I haven't quite read all of it. But what we have here, we have a tendency to teach the Bible moralistically, which is not all bad, but it's not all good either. There are many morals in the Bible to pick out, especially in the Old Testament when you're reading these stories. But a lot of this is a historical account. God is actually not giving you permission to have children with your wife's maidservant. This, this is an historical account as well. 
I think we miss something when we look for, and the moral of the story is. There's that in here, too. There's also foreshadowing. There's God's overarching story of his covenant with his people, which is what I'm actually trying to focus on right now, is God's relationship with his people. And a major player in this story, of course, is Abraham. Verse 22 is almost what you could call the climax of the story. If you were looking at that plot pyramid, show of hands, who did a plot pyramid in, in English in high school? Anybody? Where it shows how the story goes along, rising action, climax, falling action. Okay. Also known as Freitag's Pyramid. Okay. If we were laying out the life of Abraham, this would be the climax of the story as far as I'm concerned. Chapter 22, Abraham tested. This is also where the uh, historic redemptive theology part of my heart just gets excited because there's so many things that you could parallel to God and his son, Jesus, in this chapter. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, for he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When they had cut enough wood for a burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I go with the boy, or I and the boy go up there. We will worship and we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. And he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay him. But the angel of the Lord called out for, to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by the horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. So there's a lot of imagery that could make you think of Jesus at this moment. A father giving his son as a sacrifice, of course, is the most obvious. But his son wouldn't have been a, uh, an appropriate sacrifice. And in the end, God provides the sacrifice. I can't imagine the conversation that Isaac and Abraham had on the way down the mountain. I have a feeling that that probably was a little tense. <laughs> because I don't know if Isaac could see the angels or not or understood why his father had tied him up and acted like he was going to kill him and then untied him and sacrificed a ram and went down the mountain. 
But as a teacher, I've had a lot of conversations where students or my daughter have asked me to explain a situation. I cannot imagine trying to explain this situation to another human being. Dad, what was that about? Nothing. <laughs> but it's because he did not withhold his son, the son of promise, the son that he waited 100 years for. He did not withhold his son from God's request. That he became even more abundantly blessed. And we are blessed through him. The whole world will be blessed through the offspring of Abraham, which we are. It's through the offspring of Abraham that our Messiah came, that these laws were given, that we become children of God. It's, it's because of this obedience. And people like to call the Old Testament a history book. Where they say, oh, it's good history. It's the backstory. You need to know it. And I agree with that, but it's so much more. If you are going to be in relationship with someone, you need to know them. You need to know about them. You find out new things all the time, even though you may have heard it a hundred times. It's through going through the Old Testament and going through the wisdom books and going through the New Testament over and over and over again. This is how we get to know God. This is how we get to understand our relationship with God. And when people say, oh, it's not a religion, it's a relationship, I say yes and yes and no. <laughs> this is, this, I will claim it. I am a religious person. This is my religion. But I have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with one true God because of Jesus Christ. And that is paramount. But in order for me to say that I know God, I must know about him. Because I'm called to live by faith and not by feeling. Feelings are not bad. Feelings are not the enemy. But we live by faith. And we know our God through scripture. And I'm incredibly blessed to read of the faith that probably exceeds mine uh, most times of someone that was willing to take their son up a mountain. To be in obedience with God. Because he understood that this God who already did the impossible could do it again. And that's an understanding that we don't always have is that the God that has blessed us can bless us again, and he can bless us bigger if he decides. But that's what we see. And as we go on through this, um, we're actually going to ship, shift our focus off of Abraham and onto Isaac and uh, eventually onto Jacob here, probably next week. But something that's very interesting about Isaac is later on in Genesis, I think uh, the next chapter, Sarah dies. His wife dies. And Abraham actually remarries and has, I believe, six more sons. God just continues to bless this man because he said he would. So uh, I often had wrongly thought that Abraham didn't really get to see how God had blessed him. That is not true. Abraham got to live with the blessing of God every day. He got to see it in front of him. He got to actually see his offspring as a very old man. And that's pretty exciting. Because as I've brought up a lot and I will continue to bring up, children are a blessing and they're a rich heritage and they're a treasure. And we need to see them as such. But that's what I have uh, for today out of this. So if you would, uh, if you're able to stand with me, I would like to pray, and then Chad will come up and do our announcement time. Father God, I thank you for your words. 
I thank you for the scripture that you've given us. I thank you for the opportunity to speak about your scripture, Lord. I pray that you would make your words ring true to people. Father God, I pray that you would make me a willing servant to stand out of the way and allow your words to speak. Father God, anything that I added that was not of you or that cheapens what you've already given us, I pray that that would be forgotten quickly. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take time for announcements. I was handed a note from Martha Whitmer. Would like to announce that anyone is welcome to stay for lunch, fellowship, even if you didn't sign up. So if, if you hadn't signed up for the baby shower, uh, you're welcome to stay anyways. So Martha wanted that to be announced. So I may be asking people to help me fill in the blanks here because minds being what they are. Uh, Willis, what day was it that you and Bill are setting up scaffolding? Okay, so Bill, Bill is setting up scaffolding to work on Rob's roof on Monday. If you are able to help him set up scaffolding. And what is the day? The day itself, is that next Saturday? Somebody. During the weekend. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sometime during the week. Okay. So if during the week you have time and would like to remove some shingles at Rob's house, Talk to Rob first. Don't just show up and start tearing pieces off his house. Because that, that may be more rude than it was in my head. Okay. Wonderful. And uh, the shingles are, are the shingles going on next Saturday then? Is that the plan? Okay. Wonderful. So next Saturday, if you are able to help put shingles on the tall, scary roof, 
please come and participate in that. And what I would actually propose is you'll see also in the bulletin that on that same Saturday, that is uh, Franklin Graham's prayer march around Washington. So uh, Miss Wendy Jones is planning to be here at the church at around noon, which would be a great time to take lunch too from working on a roof to come and pray in solidarity with Franklin Graham's march as we pray for our nation and our leaders because we are commanded to pray for our leaders and the future of this country. So that's actually going to be happening at around noon. Um, and again, if you can help work on the roof. Sorry for all the extra questions in that announcement. I, I just found myself getting my wires crossed. What do you Lunch. We should have lunch. Yeah. Why don't we have lunch here then? Um, so we'll have lunch here for the people working on the roof and for the people that came for the prayer walk. Why don't we have a, should we do carry and uh, lunch? Okay. So next Saturday, we'll have a carry and lunch here for those praying and working on the roof. Thank you. That was like watching a plan get built. Any other announcements? Okay, if there's no other announcements, we'll take time for prayer requests, praises. And now the dad's brother, my uncle, he's planning on traveling today, so keep him in your prayers. He uh, likes to come up and and help, and it's nice to be able to see him again. So he'll be traveling today. So. <laughs> 